Welcome to Oxover Gallery and to this much looked forward to conversation with um, Lisa Vandy, who has produced this beautiful exhibition that you see on the walls and in the other room, and normally also in the middle of the room. Oh, yes, everything's been pushed. Everything has been back. pushed it's back. It's usually the center, isn't it? Yeah. So Lisa has uh, several years of history with us. This is her second solo exhibition. Um, but she, we first showed, well, we were introduced to her by Chris Spring and Zach Ove. Zach Ove is an old friend of October Galleries. He's the son of Horace Ove, the filmmaker. And one day he came here and said, you've got to see the works of Lisa Vandy. They're amazing. You must go to her studio. That was to Chile and me. And of course, later we went to visit. And right there at that studio, we invited her to have an exhibition at the gallery. So that was an exciting moment. I couldn't believe it. <laughs> so this was followed by a presentation at 2018-154, where everybody saw Lisa's house for the first time. And people were extremely excited, and all of her work sold out that very evening. So that was a jump onto the world stage like I have not seen before. <laughs> that was, so. I was stunned. <laughs> yeah. So this was followed by a solo, the first solo exhibition at October Gallery. By We also put a large sculpture, superhero cog woman, into the Free Sculpture Park. And more recently, um, Lisa has worked and put the sculpture um, Dancing in Time, the ties that bind us made of rope in front of the slavery museum. She has other projects forthcoming. I'm sure she will talk about them. So it's a great pleasure to welcome Lisa to this talk. Um, now, Lisa, you said when you talked about this exhibition that this was your second album. <laughs> I was just reading about that thing where bands go, oh my God, the second album, it can be a curse. <laughs> and, you know, it, it's the point when you, you don't want to produce the same work, but obviously I have themes, recurring, recurring themes, but I wanted to up the game. And it was important to me that it was different, the work was different, and I was ready for it. So um, I feel happy that the second album, I think, has come out okay. The second album, was, what is it like for an artist, though, to work on that second album? I think you mentioned the agony of creation. I, I wanted to push myself and to work with material I hadn't worked with before. Meant that I, d I mean, I, you can draw to your heart's content, and I do. Um, and I'll maybe do, say, 40 drawings, maybe more then I'll take some away and put those on the wall and try and work to them. But those drawings on the wall, those objects could have been put together with spit. In, you, know, you, you haven't got the material in your hands to know how it's going to behave. And then once the material's in your hands, it, it will only do what it wants to do. So working with rope and all the different types of rope all behave differently. So I had to learn my way around them and understanding what they wanted to do, what they didn't want to do. And almost put the drawings away at that point. Yeah. And I think also, you know, when you produce your second show, I think the importance is also that this should be new. And I think this is the perennial struggle of the artist to create something that pushes the boundaries, that takes you into new and dangerous territory. Yes. Where you don't know whether you're going to fall off from that cliff or yes. not. Yes. Well, I'm glad to say you didn't. <laughs> you're here right Thank with you. us <laughs> and the sculptures are safely placed on plinths yes. so they're all here with you so i wanted so yesterday i went to visit lisa um at her new studio well relatively new studio where she's been for the last one and a half years and that's an ancient naval dockyard in chatham i didn't quite know what to expect so lisa collected me at the train station she put me in her car and off we drove. And we arrived at one building where I think they have rehearsals of um, um, called the midwife. Yes, because it's used, <laughs> it's a Georgian dock site basically and they, they shot um, Peaky Blinders there. Lots of films get yeah. shot there. Not recently obviously because of the actors, writer's strike, but also called the midwife is shot there. So they have tours with women dressed up as nurses and they take <laughs> tours around. So um, 
we, we walked to the one building, and that building is a thousand feet long. I think it's the longest brick building in the UK. In Europe. In Europe, mm -hmm. even. And um, we walked inside the building. Next to it was a little room which was called Spinning Room Women Only. And I initially thought, oh, this must be a gym, you know, it must be a fitness <laughs> thing. But no, it was for uh, women spinning yes. yarn at yeah, that up time. Up the stairs, the women were up there, and they weren't allowed to mix with the men yeah. in the ropery. Yeah. So we walked into that place where they manufacture rope. And they had this, so the room itself is 1,000 feet long. You cannot imagine. I looked down. And when we were walking down and down and down, and I thought I'd seen the end. But when I came to the first third, I had not even yet spied the very end of that room, which was amazing. And all the objects in this room were so full of history. They smelled so wonderful. They were so old, and they were telling so many stories. It was so exciting. You see how rope w was spun in these long, old machines. But at the same time, the rope was hanging on the side of the walls. And I felt as I had been taken to the Arsenale at the Venice Biennale. It looked almost like that. It was another type of installation, you know, maybe an artist um, creating work out of ropes, which is very, you know, not out of ropes, but hanging, wall hanging, which I've seen variously these days. So that was an exciting place, and it was a, a place that really imbued a, imbued you with its spirit that gave so much back, so much more back than you could even put in when you walked into it. And then out of this magical situation, we continued with the car, we drove around the corner, towering on the corner is Lisa's big sculpture out of rope, um, which it looks, this is the maquette for it, this big, big work here, which you made for the Slavery Museum in Liverpool. Again, the, 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 the dancing in time, the ties that bind us. And then we drove around the corner and we came to another extremely long building and the seaside. And you look, it was as if you were driving into a De Chirico painting. Wow. You know, and De Chirico is one of my most favorite painters. And I really enjoyed when we were driving towards Lisa's studio. Now, Lisa's studio has a porch and three columns outside it. So it was very much like the curator. She was taking me into that space, into that studio. She opened the door. It was made out of old brick that had a lot of sense and sensibility to it. And all the, um, all the tools and other objects, found objects, were displayed on the wall in equal, in equilibrium. So you didn't know whether you were looking at a tool or a found object. You were finding yourself in a surrealist dream. <laughs> oh my God, I'd reach, I'd reach dream state, you know. I was the Kiriko Magritte, you know, how much better could it get? And of course there was Lisa um, with her, you know, with her studio. And then she took me to the, the, the room that had the kilns in it where you could make other objects. Again, that was a magical room because it had, not, it had been redone, but everything was kind of left in place so it could breathe out its own history. You know, the bricks were not, you know, they were not painted, but they could tell you, each brick could tell you its history. It was such a wonderful um, um, visit. And then in front of it, magically, there were all these wooden blocks, little wooden blocks that had been pulled out from the floor. And they reminded me so much of the work of Ella Natchui. Yes. Um, so th this was the visit. So I can hardly, I mean, you know, it's self-obvious now my question, but I'm going to ask it nonetheless. Why did you move there? <laughs> well, How did you move that, there? That was just luck, as so many things are, really. And my, mm. my partner, Kaz, is great friend, Stephen, is an antique dealer. And he bought a big house within the dockyard the captain's house, actually. We call it the rear admiral's mm. house. But, um, <laughs> uh, wait, wait. Um, but so he's an antique dealer, so he also had space, uh, the lead and paint mill further along, to store lots of his stuff, because his idea is to turn the house into a showroom. So it's a big space. And then when I saw the storage space as well, I was thinking, are there other spaces here where I could have a studio? Because my studio in Hackney is just getting too small, for obvious reasons. <laughs> And um, so we got, he got onto the estate manager, 
and he showed us that site. Meanwhile, I took a temporary space there for over a year while that was being refurbished. Um, so it was all luck, really. It was, it was great luck. And yeah. I think another feature, being an estate agent now, of the building of that studio is that the window looks directly onto the sea. So you see all the boats, boats passing. You know, you Sometimes see the quite big, big ships, yeah. the small ships. And it's only a narrow... I call it an estuary, but it's not. It's a river, actually. It's the it's Medway, river, isn't it? Yes, it's, yeah. But round the corner in Rochester, there is a big timber yard. So often get once or twice a week, really huge ships go through. Yeah. And I'm just looking at waking something, looking out of my window. And there's this massive boat going through. It's quite, it, it's exciting. I have to stop and watch it until it's cleared. I know. So that adds to <laughs> that decurical painting. <laughs> yeah, to have a ship sailing through this. So then, okay, so then I returned to the gallery and I saw the installation of your works here just in passing, just out, the, out of the corner of my eyes. You have to imagine, normally the figures are in the middle of the room, you know, they're placed on, 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 the, on the, 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 the pillars that they're on, but they, you know, they create the crowd. And I saw it and I suddenly thought, oh my God, I'm walking by the soul of the studio. It was as if the soul of the studio had been transposed to here. And it made me reminded me in the first, first of the works that I had seen many years ago, and I didn't quite understand at that point, of uh, Rachel White Reed, who had cast in plaster the boxes that her father left behind after he died. So you had all that was at the Gagosians, so you had all these plaster boxes, and it was the interior of that box that I was looking at. And in this case, I was looking at the interior, at the soul of the studio. I didn't linger, because of course you can only have that impression once. Yes. I continued walking, but it stayed fixed in my mind. I can still see the, the, the way it congealed together and made that one big being, which was wonderful. Um, so I want to go on a little bit, and I wanted to go on to what we call curation of the works. Um, so as I mentioned to you, we had them in the middle of the room. So when I first came to see the works after they had been transported from Lisa studio to storage to here, they were standing on boxes and maybe on pillars and they looked like a big bunch of unruly children. And I thought, oh my God, what am I going to do with these guys now, you know? Where, where is Lisa? Oh, and Larry, our wonderful curator, said to me, oh, Lisa is not here today. Um, she's coming tomorrow. So I was on my own, and of course with Larry, to make sense of that crowd that was looking at me. Um, so I looked at it, and then I had my rational mind come in. I said, well, I'm just going to rationalize them. I put the, all the tall ones on tall plinths, and then all the smaller ones around, and first they were in a line, then I made them in zigzags, then they moved further out, further together, etc. So they had a, suddenly had a rational element to them. At the same time, I remembered my mother saying, who said, when the leaves fall from trees, they never fall in a straight line. You know, they don't have, they don't work with rational things, they work with organic things. So I thought, oh good, that might be right. So after I had um, put this together and also hung the other, I was anxiously expecting Lisa's visit because Lisa could have said, oh my God, they all look wrong. You know, when you come, when you work on works in your studio as an artist and then come in and somebody has kind of taken such a sensitive, really, conglomeration of objects such as these and put them together in some other way, you think, oh my God. But thankfully, Lisa was delighted. We thought, what do you want to say anything about that, about the rational and the irrational? And the I, I mean, I, I heavily rely on you to set the pieces. And it's better that someone else does it than me. And obviously, I completely trust you. We have history. Um, it's much better that someone else does it because I've seen them all day, every day. I can't separate myself. and. It was a real joy to see them instead of, I mean, I did get the packing right after a while, but initially they were <laughs> just in big boxes with their heads poking out. So, you know, stuffed in the corner of the studio. So that's the way I'd been looking at them for months, some of them, while I was making others. So to suddenly see them 
on plinths in a white space, I could I could really see them. Also, the way you'd set them out, the the views were good. What I could see through to other pieces, there didn't seem to be any blocks, yeah. um, so you could get a good vision of quite a few pieces. Um, so I, I'm really happy with the way it was laid out. Yeah, so I was I was grateful for that and. Um, um, my big question was, were they dancing? <laughs> and they are. <laughs> and they are you can't dancing. stop them. And we don't know what happens <laughs> at night. What happens at night. <laughs> so can you just a little bit, you know, we have touched upon these works, but can you tell us a little more history about these works? The rope pieces, um, mo moving my studio to, to Chatham, of course I had to go into the ropery constantly because it's... You just have to, don't you? You, you? I couldn't keep away from it. And eventually met the manager there, lovely woman, Alex Rowling, and she, oh, you're an artist, we love artists. And it was winter, I remember, and she gave me all this rope. Now, if we look at the third piece along here, whose name, of course, I cannot remember, that comes from a piece of rope. Oh, I don't know. About like that. So she's giving, yes, that one, yeah. So she gave me all this rope, but rope when it's when it's cold, Poco, thank you, of course. Um, rope when it's cold is stiff, like it's like metal. So I had to wrangle all this, because they're like two meters long, it's <laughs> like that, and all these other pieces into the car. And I got them back to the studio and I made a little hanging place to put them up. And then, of course, I was just looking, 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 looking. And about a week later, I started playing with it, the rope. I thought this is good. This is good, and then I started doing some drawings, and I couldn't. I could. Rope is an incredibly tactile thing. You you have to touch it, so I started to play, and then I was drawing, playing, drawing, playing. Then the drawings went away, and I just continued because I started to understand how each one wanted to, how how you can manipulate them and how you can't. Yeah. Also from the ropery. Um, they're so kind, those guys there. I learnt techniques. They taught me techniques as well. Very generous. They'd make little videos to show me how you could do certain things. And and then I sort of was doing something one day, and then they went, I think you're doing macrame now. That's really good. Well done, Lisa. <laughs> <laughs> it really made me laugh. I mean, it's, it's wonderful when you're in that big ropery, you know, in that room where they make ropes. Um, they have all sorts of ropes lying around. There was one lying on the windowsill, looked like a very long sausage dog yes. um, and it had the hair coming out so I immediately went to stroke it. Yeah. Um, then I had to re, you know, pull myself back and I thought, why am I stroking this piece of rope? You, how can you stop yourself? How can I stop myself? Then I thought, well, you know, this is the spirit of Lisa's culture. Yes, rope was made to be handled. This wonderful hair, what looked like hair. That's what I love about it as well, is the different textures you can get from it. So twists, mm. which you would have seen because it's on the... <laughs> that's one piece of rope then with what they call whipping the, all the smaller rope going round it holding together is called whipping and the, the ropery the rope, uh, master rope makers taught me how to do that um, that's one piece of rope so from the top that texture and then from the bottom by not teasing it out so much you get a different texture so from one piece you can get a huge variety of feeling really yeah. you know and I, I do think I notice when people come in I think you do get a bit of a zhuzh from rope from textural get, pieces I think you get a, a bodily feeling from it somehow you, you get a bodily feeling you know mm. they had one very large room which was extremely impressive I think you, Louisa, you explained to me it because it was a naval rope yard that they invested so much money in it it had huge windows very high up, and it was the rope pulling room, you know, where yes, they the testing the testing, the testing the strength. Where they sort of, yeah, test the strength of the rope, and then pinned against the wall was this limp rope with four things hanging from it, you know. Obviously, they'd had a hard time being tested, you know, yeah. in yes. different strengths. <laughs> so well, those two that pieces on that wall in there were my um, early inspirations. Yeah. Because I was looking at them that way, and I was looking at the thing, oh, actually, they're figures. Yeah. And to me, already dancing. Yes. So I also singled out a couple of works, and I think we can go to them now since we're already on the subject. I put them next to us. This was this Harlem Shake 
and the cotillon next to us. And I just thought, maybe you could tell us a little bit more about these two pieces. Yeah, I mean, it's really funny because, I, I, you know, I, I do all these drawings, as I've said a couple of times now, but, and then mm -hmm. it just starts. I honestly don't know what I'm doing. Yeah. It is instinctive work. Yeah. And I hadn't really thought about that until I realized I had to talk today. <laughs> That I really don't know what I'm doing until I'm like nearly almost done with it. You know, I I got some bases made. These cone, this is the, the cone-shaped bases. They are a riff on the tops. They're called the tops. There are these. Inc if you ever get down to Chatham Dockyard, the ropery there, some of them these pieces, these cone-shaped pieces of wood, are this high. And they, they've got grooves, three grooves running through them. And they sit at the back of one of the machines that holds, stops the rope. That's where the rope stops, basically. And so these big pieces get worn away. Some of them are made in lignum vitae. They've never had to make a new one. I mean, this is a rope, ropery that's been working since the 18, early 1800s. You know, it, it, and all the machines are from that period, so they can repair them. Everything has got an incredible history. So th I don't really know what I'm doing. I'm also grabbing materials, because as you talked about the three-dimensional objects in the room, they are like my 3D mood board. And um, I suddenly realized I needed to start using those objects. And there's lots of objects that come out of the hulls. So the hulls arrive, and they've often got masts yeah. and rigging. And I can't throw it away, because someone's made it, and they have lovely patination and really odd little clips and things. I keep them all. And I was really keen to try and pull them into some of these sculptures. So, I mean, that is actually an old skipping rope. This. Yeah, so okay, here. that's wonderful. But I thought <coughs> that was a perfect part of the, 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 the narrative. Um, some of them have got masts from hulls going through them. This one behind you here, the hoop dance. And um, Kumbo both got um, masks from the hulls coming through them. So I'm, I've, I get everything out, all those odd bits, and, mm -hmm. and then I just start to play. Yeah. I think that's the only way I can put it, really. Yeah, right. And then they start getting a personality, and I can feel it. Um, and I can feel like I kind of know them, yeah. you know, and I know what they want to say in a way. And just very, very pleased with herself, this one. I know. Do you know what I mean? And I know. Just yes. like, yeah. mm, <laughs> like Off to do a waltz. Yeah. I don't know who's going to join her. Yeah. But yeah, super pleased with herself. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, it's when we work with Ella Natchi, one of his sayings is always, I work with what the environment throws up. There we and go. There we go. It completely makes sense to what me. What you do. Um, in that sense. So, but I think also another really important element in this particular part of the, you know, your series of works is dance. And, and you know, you mentioned that, of course, that, you know, you, you read, I mean, you had read twice, I think, Barbara Ehrenreich's book, The Joy of Dancing. Um, um, not sure dancing in the Streets, A History of Collective history, Joy. Yeah. History of Collective Joy. Um, and, um, you know, in, there's in one chapter she talks about the power of numbers. You know, of, of you know, of, of course, dance stretching down to ancient times. You know, people doing their ordinary jobs during the day, but then getting together into that ecstatic dance. Yes. And um, I think that I think I felt that was an important part of this work, as you also explained it um, to us. Yeah, when you were ref referring to hunting. Um, yes, she puts forward uh, an idea that, I mean, because dance is so important, just looking at the, um, how it could have come about, and she, uh, it's her hypothesis, it's not uh, that pos quite possibly going off, men and women, not just the men, hunting, you're bigger in numbers, basically, and if you have something dangerous coming towards you, or you're going towards it, and you want to frighten it into a corner, that the big numbers, you coming together, you look like a much, you could look like one creature with lots of arms, and then shaking sticks, stamping feet, creating a rhythm, and maybe the idea is that when they went back to camp, they reenacted their successful yeah. hunt. Yeah. 
and that becomes a way of teaching other people how to do it. So that's, I found that idea really interesting that that could be the origin of dance. But it's also interesting that she talks about this as well, that we enjoy dance. Yeah. And the, the, the body enjoys dance. The body likes to eat. The body likes sex. The, we love sex. We love food. We love dance. The body has allowed us. To, so why isn't it broader? Why did we, why do we enjoy dance so much? It's actually, it's in our DNA. Yeah. That's and the body has made us want to like it, so we should be doing it. It shouldn't be crushed out of our lives. No, it shouldn't, but I think, you know, there's, I'm sure Jesse is somebody who will answer that question when I ask him. He never stops dancing. Later. He never <laughs> stops dancing. Um, I'll pull him into the conversation at a later point. Maybe we can discuss the resistance to dance um, in, in, the, in that question. Um, so, but... Um, <sighs> So yes, so very much so. So you lose yourself in dance. Basically, that's what she says. You lose your body, you become a different person, you connect your communion with the other people in the dance. So I was just looking at some great examples. Um, we have an accountant here. His name is Ibrahim from Sierra Leone. And he's here. And he emerges from the office downstairs having worked on the audit of all of October Gallery for the whole year. And he comes into this room with an incredible burst of energy um, and starts dancing. You said, you've got to dance. And he pulls everybody into that scenario. So he's able to switch as he walks up the stairs and into this room from an accountant to the most ecstatic dancer. So I think this really, I think it's a wonderful illustration of what Barbara Ehrenreich describes in her book. And he inspires all of us so, and we become much happier. I became much happier yes. some time ago, was yes. dancing away, you know, throwing things up and down, you know, loves body loves movement. And then, of course, she also refers to Dionysos yes. and to the troubadour, you know, that character that kind of walks into different scenes, like even Tennessee Williams, he appears many times as that poet musician that engages other people into various activities. Totally connects people. Yeah, are you a troubadour? <laughs> maybe, well, maybe you are. Maybe you are. Yes, I think that could be a great way Way of, you know, positive way of thinking about your knees is that you will truly become that troubadour that you really need to be. Um, and I think what also is so interesting is the smell of these various sculptures. I had a small... Lily, you, you work here. Did you, do you notice the smell when you come in? I think we had a little smelling session. Yeah. I had a little smelling session with somebody else. And we but went around speaking. all the pe well, the selection of pieces because they all smelled so different. There might be coconut, there might be machine oil, but within that embedded are so many memories. You know, I think that smell, does that, smell you know, evokes so many different memories. And, you know, I think I would recommend, of course, they don't put your nose directly into the sculptures, Feel to go free. close and smell them because it also gives you a little bit of that experience I had yesterday in the ropery, in the yeah. ropery yeah. which collected yeah, all these the smells best, yeah. at once. That's rich, isn't it? Yeah. And then the other thing that these, um, um, you know, these dance figures have, they evoke a great community spirit. And I noticed that very much in the opening, everybody felt extremely at ease. Everybody had integrated themselves between the sculptures. You could, didn't know whether there was hair walking by or was a sculpture. And everybody was extremely happy and engaged in very long That's conversations. So do you want to say something about well, that? Uh, all, I mean, I'm, I'm just pleased. Um, I, th I think I have created something quite unusual. I don't think you're going to see sculptures like this anywhere else. But I think the tactileness of them somehow puts people at ease as well and you don't quite know what they are. And so I think the conversation helps you understand what they are, talking to other people. Um, I mean, it pleases me enormously to think that uh, I do want people to be able to touch them, but it's not, it's not legal in the gallery, I'm afraid, is it? Um, I, well, I, <laughs> kind of, 
I don't, the, the, the sculpture in, in, in <laughs> Liverpool, I'd said to them, don't put up a do not touch sign. It's rope. People are gonna, <laughs> uh, people are gonna touch it. You won't be able to stop them. Um, of course, I did have to take into effect that the, um, the, what the, the, what's it called? That music show, the European music show where all the countries, your oh, song contest was on, yeah. just <clears throat> literally next door. And there was going to be a lot of traffic and a lot of probably quite drunk people. Yeah. But I thought, well, are they, they're going to do it anyway. Just leave it. And the, But the joy was um, somebody snapped a few pictures of children playing within the rope mm -hmm. like a maypole. And that to me was like, because then you're making something a bit more interactive. Yes, of course. Uh, that was really pleasing. Yes, and it has that little bit, that maypole If I did another one, I would it. really play on that more. Yeah. And made sure that I mean, it's every, I try to make everything very solid mm -hmm. and um, unbreakable. But of course, people tugging on things is in the wrong direction could cause upset. If I do another one, I will make it fully. Um, inter, inter, I will fully integrate the idea of people being able to play. Yeah. So I think that brings me to a good point where we can talk about your larger sculptures. Um, outdoor sculptures, public sculptures. So Lisa has made a series of sculptures and continues working on those. One I already mentioned is superhero cog woman, dynamo women, yet as yet come not quite created. Yeah, she's the copper piece in the corner. The idea is that she's very, very big. That, yeah. that's, a, that's a tiny thing. So if you look at that copper in the corner with that sort of swirling copper circle, Lisa showed me, and I, you know, I thought it was reality. You know, I'm also an artist. So oh yeah, I guess I, I, did, a, easy, I did a render. Easily be fooled. Did a render, you know, yeah. where that two huge sculptures like this were standing on cliff's edge, overlooking the roaring sea. Uh, that impression was so wonderful, and I do hope very much that can be so. made. Yes, I've made a series of small ones in copper and aluminium, all, all slightly different, um, with the idea of uh, making. I don't know how many feet, oh, I just think enormous will do. Um, because I think being underneath as well and being able to see those forms would be lovely, let alone from a distance. <coughs> and the idea is that she, whilst she's fixed like that, and she has to be near water, she's a guardian of the water. Yeah. She's looking out for souls lost at sea and we all understand the meanings of that. Um, she's a protector, but she's also a reminder of the forces of nature. The idea being that if you let her loose, she would do untold damage. Um, so she serves in two ways as a, a guardian and a protector. That's, that's quite wonderful, yeah, to think of. And she has yet to be made. Yeah, yeah one day. So please encourage. Yeah. Donations, Lisa, by donations by the doors. Encourage, you, yeah. her, encourage everybody <laughs> that Lisa can make that sculpture. Just, it, it would be tremendous, yeah. I think, because I think the time is right for her. Yes, the time is right. And then the other one that had success is Superhero Cogwoman. Yes, Superhero so Cogwoman. that is going to have another iteration. Yes, I'm I, I mean, Superhero Cogwoman me. basically shouldn't be on her own because she's made of cogs and cogs don't work on their own. You have to have another cog to go against, don't you? So um, I've only been able to, you know, financially get one done, and but she's had a lot of interest. And now, thankfully, someone is paying for another one to be made. And uh, there'll be, so there'll be two of them on top of Temple Tube Station on the embankment in September. That's really thrilling, thrilling for me because the idea is that it's superhero Cogwoman and her aunt and her niece <laughs> and her grandmother, uh, you know, and her great grand. It, 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 it's a f it's a family. There yeah. should be seven, yeah. to my mind. Uh, we always say odd numbers. You, you, you talked about that with you. Um, but they are an extended, they should be an extended family and they're all slightly different. But what I, in order to try and be smart, there are only, I think, 12 elements. So from those 12 different elements, you know, each one has a mold, each section has a mold, you can make seven figures that will all be very different. So I tried to be really practical, you know, as lots of women are, I think. <laughs> um, but also, to me, that was, there was a kind of wit in that. Yeah, I thought. Yeah, of course, of course. Well, it, when 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 will they be at Temple? From September, I think. From September. That's just about to start on it now.
Make, please make your journey. Book your tickets now. <laughs> Should be up. For, they'll, they'll, they'll be up for a year. Yeah. Which is very exciting. It means I'll have that's, that's three right. public sculptures up. Yeah. In, in England, that's, for exactly. me, that's like thrilling. That's that makes me go back to the um, dancing in time, the ties that bind us, for which this is the maquette, this work here. That's now outside the ropery. So Lisa created that initially to stand outside the Slavery Museum in Liverpool. Um, how? Just tell us a little bit about how that got to came to it was it came it to was be. Thrilling. I brought <coughs> in to see you in Chile. I brought in twist, jig, and mm. copper bottom. That's right. I brought them in to see you, and you loved them. Yes. And then. <coughs> Nicholas Selsby Cunningham, who's curator at the um, Liverpool Museums, was looking for an artist for a pop-up sculpture to be next to... Um, it's right close to the Tate. Uh, it's Canning Dock, I think. Not Albert, it's Canning Dock. Looking for a sculpture to go up there. And um, you guys put my rope pieces under her nose. and She was really intrigued and really interested, saying, do you think she could make a bigger version? My, I have a history in set design, so I... I I feel very confident about making big things because I've seen lots of big things. I did art direct the MTV Awards. I worked on the Commonwealth Games when they're in Manchester. I designed all the staging and the Royal Box, all that area, the floor cloth. And I'm used to seeing big things made. And I have, I know that someone, I know all the skills that people have to make, let that happen as well. So I felt pretty confident to say, yeah, I could ha happily make a larger one. So I did these drawings for her, one at three metres, one at four metres, one at five metres, with my fingers crossed. And she just went, oh, well, it's got to be five metres, hasn't it? <laughs> so I was like, phew. Because yeah. I think sculptures either have to be just a bit bigger than you, yes. or much bigger than yes. you, yes. To, indeed, to, to work. Indeed, you know what, that's, I think that's where the community spirit was here so much. Because when you looked at the display, they were just about your height. Yes, I think it has a real impact. communicate with them directly. Yes, that yeah. is it. Yeah. And Liverpool, I mean, and museums, they bring me on to another question. I want to talk to you just a moment about your house, which, you know, really launched you into the spheres of the art world. Um, one very large hall that you see in the other room is called Pomp and Circumstance. And very soon you will also be able to see that in the museum. I'm not quite telling you the whole story yet, but I wonder whether, Lisa, you can talk us through a little bit about Pomp and Circumstance, how you made your house, what the inspiration is, where you find the model boats, and also about this work behind the light there, which is called Resistance, yeah. um, which is part of your new series of halls. So there's a kind of five-year gap between them. Yes. Um, yeah, just yes, give so us a little pomp bit Pomp and of Circumstance. Well, so the hulls, um, basically, obviously they're second hand. Most of them are what you'd call pond boats, really. You know, you see the, you don't see it very often now. I've seen it actually in Bosham in Hampshire. The guys get the model boats and they're mostly radio controlled. But in, when I was younger, they'd be on the pond in the middle of the green. There'd be a big pond set south. So something. Guys would push their little boats across. They're mostly pond boats. But some of them are beautifully crafted maquettes for yachts, for proper or racing yachts. So some of them, I mean, the, you talk about resistance, the craftsmanship on that is extraordinary. It only takes me to ruin it, you know what I mean? I have to treat it with incredible care. If I make a mistake, I can't really put it right. I can't fill. It's, it's boarded out, it's just beautiful. Um, so I have a hull dealer. We meet in car parks around the M25. <laughs> <laughs> it's so mad. He comes in his big van, I take the estate car, he opens it out, drags things out, I bring the cash, <laughs> and off we go. <laughs> it's so mad. Um, he knows which ones that I'll be interested in. He also sells to people who do proper repairs get the rigging done and you know they go on stands and on sales but he knows the ones that will interest me and he would if he was here he'd be able to tell you about every single hull and its history he's one of those yes. brain box yes. uh, he's a great guy um, so I get the hulls from him and they won't they won't be around forever so the other 
I think it was about a year and a half ago, I bought a hundred little ones from him. Yeah, that's that's one. That yeah, same yeah. style. He yeah. found this collection. Yeah, I think there are few in the other. Yeah, room that this guy yes. made so many of them, and obviously they didn't go on mm -hmm. to where they were supposed to go. So, I I I live in fear of running out of them. So I bought the lot. <laughs> um, it's just, <laughs> if I'd come away and not done it, I would have, you know, uh, or driving down to see. I was going to Somerset to see him that time. I was thinking, shall I? Shall I? Shall I, shall I? And I but I knew if I drove back and hadn't done it, I'd kick myself because that you know the chance would be gone um so paul my hull man um the hulls have to sit <laughs> on my bench for quite a while because i'm just not sure what i'm going to do with them and I, I can never rush into it and it's in the process of cleaning them sometimes i'm just cleaning them to get the dirt off sometimes i have to oil them uh, sometimes a little bit of paint repair but i prefer to leave them with their patination i prefer to see them as they are like that, the one there at yeah. the back. That's, you know, I, I don't want to touch it. It's got yeah. character already. Yeah. And so then I'm waiting to realize what I'm going to use to, um, to finish them. So it's a question for me of making two disparate sets of things look like one. So I like to think that's what it always looked like. You know, the mm -hmm. whole and that, uh, they've, uh, they've come to join each other into one thing. They're not two separate yeah, the, things. The, 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 the things that animate the whole, yeah. so to yeah. say. The objects, a little bit like the, the Congolese power figures that yes. have nails driven into yes. them, that yes. sort of magical aspect. They are uh, guardians. Yeah. And so, but I noticed, of course, it was in these five years that material changed. I can now dis yeah. discern rope yes. in the uh, new it house. Just, of course, had made perfect sense to start integrating yes. <laughs> those two materials. And um, resistance is, it's like a little fist. A little fist, yeah. And yeah, that was a women's symbol as well, women's rights symbol, as well as a black power symbol. Yes, oh, wonderful. So yeah. that really played on my mind. And it's, a, it's so funny, because actually it was meant to be like, um, I think it's called a monkey fist knot or something, but I couldn't do it. I just, I'm not very good at, I go onto YouTube things, follow, I can't follow, I don't know why, I've got something in the I brain. You follow your own I can't do it, so, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so um, we kind of made it up in the end. Kaz was helping me because oh, the <laughs> deadline was getting tight. And uh, we got it, we got that, that fist feeling. And I was going to add more to it, but that hull, if I drill any more into it, I'm going to lose the structure within it. Yes. Because all the ribs... It's so beautiful. There's all brass nails all around that in length, like that, to holding the ribs together. And if I go through another set, when I picked it up, it rattled. Yeah. So I've already done damage inside. And if I do any more, the structure yes. might get weak. Yeah, I think there's so, a limit. Yeah. yeah. So it's restraint and resistance. <laughs> resistance. So the material limit, in a sense. Yes. yes. And, and, and I think the other hull that you will see in a minute when you walk around the corner. Oh, pomp and circumstance. Pomp and circumstance. Yeah. I think that's horse hair. That's horse that's hair. Well, that's a really big hull. and Not as heavy. That is, what was that? Eight, eight, eight or ten kilos, that? Yeah. It's so... Mm. Yeah. That one, because it's a different material. I think, uh, I think it's fiberglass, that one. Or very light wood. Mm. I can't remember now. I haven't seen it for such a long time. And um, so she's just lying on the bench, and I was just thinking, God, you look so like you want pride and stuff, don't I you? Know. Just the colour somehow made me think of pa um, naval pageants. Yeah. So I don't know, like brass buttons and all that stuff. Yes. You know. It looks like that. Yeah. yeah so that brass element. Um, I brought all these it, yes. Hanks. Is yeah. it, are they called Hanks horse? Of hair? Is it Hanks? Or, oh, yeah. Hanks, I, don't I brought loads of Hanks hair. of hair, <laughs> horse hair from this company who I can no longer find yeah. anymore. So I've run out of that. Um, mm. That piece was my last bit of horse hair. So uh, the, uh, the company, I don't think they sell it anymore, but I don't know where, where else I'd probably find it. I don't know. But the horse hair just, you know, when they have those, uh, uh, pr pr you know, pr procession. But yeah, the the horses have even got yeah, they've got things on top. Yeah, made me made me think of that. So yeah. then the little brass tubes, I cut loads of brass tubes, polished, blah blah blah. Then because I think yeah, that must be fiberglass. That when you can't drill in 
too big because it would just start to shatter. So I found some golf plastic golf tees. <laughs> so that is it. And I'm telling you the magic. And Jesse says I shouldn't. It's just like you don't need to know how things are made, but I find it fascinating. Golf tee at the bottom of the brass tube. So then that golf tee, because it's plastic, it slightly grips the hole, and the oh, hole yes. doesn't have to be so big. Yeah. And then the horsehair inside of the tube. And once I found that solution, it was like, yeah. And then the horsehair was really long, so I got Cass to come along and do a haircut, <laughs> which she thoroughly enjoyed. <laughs> and then you brought it here, and, and I fell in love with it. it. Yes, you did. <laughs> I did fall in love you, with Yes, it, yeah. you've always loved that yeah, piece. Yeah, and I think Chile, my colleague yeah. also, we always loved that piece this so much. came out just right. So when I, after, so after I went to your studio, then came back here to see the soul of your studio, I followed that up with going to the exhibition at the Royal Academy, Entangled Past, yes. for a final visit. And for me, the two standout installations lit magnificently are Hugh Locke's Armada, mm. which is a series of uh, model boats with different objects attached I've to it. I've spoken to you about them. Yeah, yeah. yeah. and they are, they are sort of floating in the air yeah. and sort of take up the entire room. And um, another installation, which is almost 30 years old now, Aquia wow. Surviving Children, made out of driftwood <coughs> by artists we work with, Ella Natchui. Um, now, both of these were lit I, in a way that I will never see them again, so I sat there for a little while to see how much I could absorb and then they had, you know, they were imbued with that same spirit that your work had when I visited you. So there was a huge spiritual connection of these works. And I think that takes me to the, um, the speech that Michelle Charters gave at the opening, where oh. she said, and we all cried afterwards, or at that moment, is where she said, the ancestors are looking down at you whilst you make the work. So yeah, I'm sure I that very touching. they are looking down on you, and also, of course, on the artists I just mentioned. But in that context, I thought, well, since we are now going to the past, how do we see the future? What, what do you see in the future? I see, like, sleeping a lot. Yes. <laughs> Next week. Yeah. I will continue, always continue to make whole pieces because I can't not. I, I, f I find them fascinating. It ties into my childhood as well. Bizarrely enough, I, I remembered only about six months ago that in Bosom I worked in a chandlery for a while and cut rope. So weird. And as um, in, in my early 30s, I worked in Love in a big cultural um, institution there doing some sets for them. And in those days, you could cycle round the port, I mean, the dockyard. You could never do that now, I'm sure. Security would be on. You could cycle round and... Me and my friend Thierry, a Martinique artist, we used to go down to the dry docks and look up at the boats. So it's, I guess everything's in there, isn't it, always? It's, everything is in there, and I think it'll come out. I already saw possibilities for you when I walked through that dockyard. I saw this amazing, huge pile of a chain lying there. Yes, isn't that beautiful? <laughs> isn't that amazing? Stop. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Stop. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> How much weight can these walls take? <laughs> no, I think it's amazing. I, I, for me, I want to keep developing this work mm. because it's not finished yet. The the rope figures aren't finished yet. I've, there's a lot more I can do with them. I'd love to have bigger versions again, of course. One in every port, obviously. Um, <laughs> oh, well, it's interesting though because, of course, every port had its had its ropery. Yeah. So there's an area in Liverpool called Ropery, mm -hmm. but most of those Roperies were outdoors. They made rope outdoors. Yeah. But of course, because this was a naval site, it's all about pomp. And yes. Look at how yes. fabulous we are. Yeah. My pillar's got four pillars. I mean, it's ludicrous. It's, it's not a big building, is it? It's probably the smallest building there, like a bungalow, but no, we'll have pillars there. Yeah. So everything's made with a kind of yeah, grandness, grand isn't it? Place, yes. So... Um, I, I can see myself continuing these figures and the hulls. Um, I do have a, a collection of, uh, they're called shuttles, weaving shuttles. Big ones that were used for carpet making. Yes. They look like boats, yes. don't they? One, yes. And uh, I've got a collection of those. I'm thinking to start playing with 
that and rope as well. But I don't know what I'll do yet. It's, uh, yeah, so that'll be really it could be interesting, and interesting because it's a, you know the theme yes. kind of that'll be your third album. Y yes, it will be. Don't it'll frighten me. Yeah, album, yes. it'll be, it might it might be a bit of a yarn. <laughs> tell you how this is going to pan out. First of all, I'm going to thank Lisa, and then I'm going to invite my two colleagues who have written extensively about Lisa, Sarah Thornton and Elia and Bradshaw, to ask a question each and then open it to the public. But first of all, for this conversation, I want to thank you, Lisa. Thank, thank you, Elizabeth. Thank, thank you very much. So I think it would, I want, would love to have Jesse or Elary, whoever wants to ask the first question, because you've studied her work so much. Um, Elary wrote the catalog text, and Jesse has written extremely widely, widely on Lisa. It's been such a pleasure to work with Lisa, and I've learned so much from her. And I think what's wonderful about her work is it's such a, a powerful reclamation of um, a material that has is steeped in such history. Um, and so I have two questions. Um, just we talked about this a little bit in the catalog. What what does it mean to you to use this medium and kind of transpose it or elevate it into the realm of dance from what it's been used for previously? It felt important to elevate it to that realm, really. Um, rope. Wow. You know what? It's history, isn't it? It's it's negative and positive history, isn't it? It's used to build things, uh, extraordinary things, and yet we have all the negative association with lynching and hanging, etc. Um, and its use in really supporting empire and colonization. It, it's it's what kept all those boats going, all those ships going. Um, and the irony is not lost on me. That as a black woman, I'm working in a naval dockyard trying to <laughs> turn this thing yeah. on its head. You know, yeah. it, it, it does bring a smile to my face um, because I'm so I feel like I'm releasing it with the dance, with the idea of dance. Um, reading uh, Barbara Enright's book really helped underpin my rationale for the work, and that that idea of freeing. These, these figures, with the, this history with rope suggesting dance and movement felt like I was sort of making a... Uh, it's hard to explain. I don't know if you understand it. Anyway, it's a sort of a liberation of the, the material, really, and taking it away from its more negative um, state. Yeah, associations, yeah. And continuing this idea of subversion, or uh, the inspiration behind your photographs, which are sat behind you. Yes. So that when I first, I've tried to document the work as I make it, because then I can remember what it was like before I made the mistake, and I can go back. So I was photographing the first three, and I only had, I think it was like a, you know, there's wallpaper pasting tables. So I put that up on the desk, and, put the, and then I was like, oh my God, this is perfect. This tone with that is just perfect and it started to make me think of um, museum collections anthropological collections where it's it's a record of something it's not an art photo it's a record of something and the idea that i wanted to put across is that you wouldn't know when they were done whether was it from the 20s have they snapped something abroad somewhere and brought this information back was it two years ago was it a hundred years ago and that that's the play that's the sense of play here um, I worked with a great photographer called Mel Thompson and we, it took us about a year and a half on and off to get the to get it absolutely right it was quite tricky in a way um, but I'm so happy with them I, I do think they look like an ethnographical record of something that's I think I think it came off yeah I was going to invite Jesse, who he's, has the microphone. I've got your microphone. I want to continue to talk about that idea of museums, because the thing that fascinates me, Lisa, about your work, um, I'm thinking about the, 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 the big one is over in Belgium, and I know we have some Congolese people in the room. The, the, there's, there's a big museum in Belgium, in, in Tuveren, where 
the Leopold II, of course, Congo was, a, was, was his personal domain. And the officials and the priests and all the people sent, all the missionaries sent, would all take these objects from the primitive peoples. And there are over 150 different groups in the Congo. Plunder. Uh, well, loot, 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 <laughs> loot. But one of the reasons they were taking them was because they were devil's objects. They were, they were mysterious. They were powerful. And if you could take the objects away from the people, you could actually destroy the religions and you could make them all Christians again. So all the, many of these objects were just burnt and many of them were taken back to the Congo. Uh, sorry, to Belgium, the, 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 the civilized place um, that had destroyed all these different cultures. And they quickly realized that the museum, the museum was too small. And so even in the, in the 1900s, they, were begin, they had to keep on building more and more onto the museum. So it was this huge museum that was called the Royal Museum of Africa, you know, giving it a great title. Now, it's just been rebranded. Um, I think it closed in 2000, maybe it opened again in 2018. It, and they did a, a five-year rebuilding and reinterpretation of, basically, they had thousands and thousands of objects that they didn't have a clue what they were. But they'd all been looted. And in trying to reinterpret, they have everything. They have Luba masks. They have all these different objects. One of the things that um, fascinates me about your work is that I mean, you talk about Celsi and you talk about you know boats on the on the pond, and it's very, very, it's very English in some sense. Yeah. You're 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 bringing. One of the things that fascinates me about your work is that, and I'm going to use a big word here, Lisa. The 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 word atavistic, which means well, the the, the Latin word atavus is a forebear. One's forefathers used to do this. So atavistic is going back to reclaim something that's in your lineage. When I see your work, it reminds me so much of the kinds of things that they have hundreds of in Tuviren. That these, and they used to call them fetishes. Yes. That, was the, that was the Christian view of this is a fetish. We burn it or we take it back and put it in a museum. We don't know what it is, but it's some kind of it's yeah. a fetish. Something Your to fear. something to fear, definitely yeah. something to fear. Something to be burnt, to be, to be destroyed. But we need at least a couple of examples to show people what these primitive people do. Yeah. There's something incredibly atavistic to me about your work, and it's not just the rope figures, because they have it in spades, but I think in the hulls as well. You're going back to a world of masks, a world of of shields, a world of all these different things that are atavistic. And you're bringing them into the present. And I think one of the things that makes them so interesting and exciting is that the objects that you add to them, we haven't a clue where they come from. So just what you said before about, I put things in so that people don't know what they're looking at. These objects are made today, they're contemporary objects, but they have that weird frisson of what is it? And that reminds us of the power of the object, the energy that's invested in each of these objects. Now, you do that naturally for some weird reason. That I would call atavistic. Right. What are you feeding off, do you think, that brings that out? Atavism. <laughs> I, don't, I don't say atavism. <laughs> I don't know, except I just I want things to look interesting. I, I, I mean, I, I, I do have one piece where I want to use domestic fittings <laughs> on one of the hulls, but I will sort of destroy the fittings first before they go on. I, I, I want to create some sort of a bit of wonder and a bit of, I don't, I'm not familiar with this. I don't want my work to seem familiar. And the objects that I use, oh, what's the word I'm looking for? have to just add that, have to add something to the whole. They have to give it that power that you're talking about. Because in my mind, they are guardians, the whole pieces, and which what is what masks were all about. And also then there's a sense of masquerade. Mm -hmm. Pomp and circumstance mm -hmm. ties into that. The feather one at the end there ties into that. Mm -hmm. um, I, I just want them to look, uh, I want people to go into the piece close, and wonder about these things as well as taking that 
that view from the back. Because there's quite interesting objects there. I'm thinking about, they're crimps mm. in the blue one there. They're crimps, I think. And so I've wound rope around them and I made the rope do what it doesn't want to do in that one, but I could because of the crimps. So making those things work together as well. Uh, I really enjoy that stage of the make, you know, lining everything up, seeing what's going to go with what, and uh, and just f finding unusual objects as well. I, I do go into car boots and <laughs> stuff, but also I often need quite a few things. I'm going up to a factory in Nuneaton, actually, in a couple of weeks, but someone I met here watched the video and said, oh, I hear that you, from the video that you like collecting old bits. said, my dad's got a factory that's closing down and full of all sorts of, I said, okay, yeah, I'm there. <laughs> you know. yeah, yeah. But it's all the sorts of took that no one else wants, yeah, yeah. actually. Yeah. No one wants it. Just but there's a, there's, there's, a, there's a huge history in, in, in Africa, too, that you gather disparate things to make an object that has combined power. Well, all those the, objects already have something, don't yeah, they? Especially yeah, all if the they're old. Yeah. Like, so, uh, there's a couple of hulls uh, uh, that were from the 1920s that I've sold through you. Um, I mean, they were already coming with some sort of energy. And, it's, uh, and I think that does... Sh I know it sounds woo-woo, and I'm not that person, but they do come imbued with something that people do pick up on, people do sense it. Well, I, I think I, I think they're stunning, stunning, and very powerful, and maybe we open it to. I didn't know about your the story about the cogs and looking over this cliffs. Um, oh, dynamo, 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 yeah. yeah. Sorry, um, looking over the cliffs, and I just thought that was really, really moving. And I, I also I know you said it was twofold, but I kind of found it double-edged. Um, and a little bit like dangerous and good um, and I wanted to know about in particular the Vogue because that is my favorite one and I love this kind of feeling of the rope and the power obviously there's a lot to do with like resistance and strength and but there is this huge theme of links and cog yes. links yes. like physical links and Cold. I can't stop that. No, and I just it's wondered. Current, is it? yeah. And then also it ties into Liverpool as well because of like Liverpool is one of the only like museums to really talk about its slave dealing history. Um, and I just wondered if you could comment about these links to the past, to the present, the collective, um, in particular to these rope thick ones. That's a very complicated question. <laughs> V I'm Sorry. glad you like Vogue. Um, I've tried to make... See, that there's families here in the rope figures. Vogue is a bit of a stray. The, the only one that's a complete loop. But in, she kind of is and she kind of isn't. But so she is striking a, a complete a pose. A runt of the litter. Ooh. Is a runt a good thing? I think it is because it's the one that sticks out at you. And it's you the one you always want. It's always the one it's you the want. It's the puppy you always want. It's the one and it's like... Yeah. Yeah, and you, it's got something about it. But it, I think it also f uh, found its individual place in the exhibition. Yes. It yes. by itself quite natural. Yes. In the front. Yeah. And I, she, I didn't know it was the runt, the odd one. No, no, no. Well, I mean, listen, she has no relations. Really, so like you can see, lots of them like they're 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 related somehow, you know, in family. But she she is she stands alone, yeah, which is kind of cool. Um, thank you, thank you very much. This was really remarkably stimulating. I wanted to ask you about, and I think I go back to Jesse's point in a way, about these ropes that are hanging. They feel like they're a headpiece. Yeah that you wear, you put it above your head. Sounds good. And it feels as if some eyes from within are looking at us. That to me is is the way, I also connected with that dance thing you were talking about in the sense that if I can cover my eyes and my face, then I can dance without any, any feeling of shame or embarrassment or wow. restrictions. Something about wow, okay. these really are sort of projecting that sense of looking out from within. And they make me feel like I'm under their eyes. That's really interesting. And I, it really 
fascinating, just sitting here and looking at them. And I've looked at, I, I missed the opening, but I've looked at your work online, and it seems to me like there's something really um, moving. It gives me the shivers. Thank you so much. Um, I love the fact that you've had quite a visceral, visceral response. I couldn't ask for anything more. Thank you. That's quite wonderful. Please. As much as we talked about a lot of dancing, mm -hmm. when I saw the pieces without reading anything, I thought about hair. Mm -hmm. And I can see that you have locks, I have braids, mm -hmm. and there's a lady who has twists mm -hmm. in this room. Mm -hmm. So I just wanted to ask you about your connection to hair. Are you a good hairstylist by any chance? <laughs> well, it's funny actually, because um, Larry was looking at resistance, and she recognized that the fist knot as a bantu knot, which is a hairstyle, isn't it? So yeah. it's funny to say that there's a great picture that Alex here from the gallery took of me when we were installing Dancing in Time in Liverpool, where I'm bending down and playing, at trying to get the, the, the bottom part of the sculpture, and my hair's got linked into it. And it's hard to tell, you know, yeah, there is a connection, but I hadn't thought about it okay. at all. Thank Larry you. actually brought that to my mind. I mean, I know they're hairy, you know, obviously, I know they're hairy, but, you know, they're rope hairy. But, but, but hair is also a thing of, of power. Power, yeah. And of course. Samson, of yes. course. Yes, would let you know about that. He, the hair was cut off. Yeah. Because his power was in his hair. Yeah, that is interesting. I'm thinking there, um, thinking with the hair thing. Because I think that's very connected to black women, you know, kind of thinking about their hair, what they're going to do with their hair, blah, blah, yeah, blah. Yeah. you know. And to me, they're like a celebration of hair. Good. They're they're um, they're golden. They're glorious. They're Good. Um, look at this. You yes, know, yes. It's, it's kind yeah, of they're all really pretty proud. Yeah, yeah. they're yeah. great. So to yeah. me, that's what it says, and I find that really uplifting. I like that people take away different things. Yeah. from them because I've done the work now it's I can't do anything more to these mm. but listening to other people's response is fascinating and uh, you know pe some people are scared to s make those kind of comments but I mean every comment's correct isn't it because it's what it's doing to you mm. and uh, you know some of your what you've said here today might get woven into my words <laughs> probably will actually by um, especially what you were saying it's very interesting to hear people's responses. I was anxious at first, but I'm not anymore. Mm. Could, could I just add on hair? Because there are all these different African groups that, that when the hair is shaped in a certain way, it has a very specific meaning. Right. So hair and meaning is also right. intimately wrapped together. This is a, this is, this is a, a young woman, woman who's looking for a husband. This is a, right. this is a woman who's, who's had three husbands and don't want no more. You know, that the, 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 the hair speaks. In, in, in very, it's a signifier, absolutely, absolutely. Can I add on the hair point? Uh, the women of Iran have uh, started a revolution, and it has to do with hair. And the fact that the, the Islamic Republic, the theocracy, has very early on, 40 years ago, argued that women have hair that stimulates sexual response, they should cover it. Yeah. And so this is the ongoing battle of power of the hair. Over, over someone's body, though. Right, emanates rays that would mm. really make men lose it. That sort of, yeah, you know. They can't and control it's themselves. It's, yeah, the cultural specificity mm. by hair is powerful. Thank you very much for the talk or for the conversation, very inspiring. Um, though I I'm keep thinking as a social anthropologist about certain aspects of it, no? so that's okay. an ongoing conversation. But coming back to the um, origin of the material you're using, I know that in ropes you would have a red um, yarn in it, especially navel ropes. So I was wondering if you came across it and what do you do with it? And I the have come across it. Yeah. It was quite annoying actually. <laughs> <laughs> but then I left it in because it's, it was hidden by the time I finished. But uh, I was happy for it to be exposed up. But at first I was quite annoyed by it. I only come across it once though. Yeah, in, a, in some manila. 
Yeah, it's really like a, a red robe, yeah, though I've forgot why it's, it's in there, and that's where we get the saying from um, to continue a talk on a red robe or on this robe. I never so knew that. Continuous. I wanted but what it was. Really, yeah, so it's, Thank you. it's not uh, by accident, really. But then the other thing, what do the robe makers around you say to your works? I love it. They absolutely love it. It's really interesting, actually. When I used to, I used to work in, in, in the film industry. The, the rope, the master rope makers, and there's one woman. They all look like riggers. They all, they, you know, they've got the piercing, the ponytail, the thing. The, but they don't have the attitude. They're all quite nerdy. You know, we love a nerd. Mm. But this is their, this is their skill, and they are completely passionate about it and they've got no ego whatsoever. So for them, so when they made the maquette, the body of that piece, they made that maquette, they didn't know what they were doing or how to do it. And apparently they were calling each other. So Leanne said, I was in the bath, 10 o'clock at night and Dave calls, I think I found out how we can do this. I'm in the bath. They were thinking about it constantly and they came up with how to make that shape. It's quite complicated how to make that kind of weaving. Uh, it's dropped a bit now because it's been, sort of, anyway, it has its character, rope slumps and changes. Mm. But now that the big piece is back from Liverpool and outside the ropery in Chatham, they are over the moon because it's like, it, A, it acts as a beacon and a signpost to the ropery, and B, it's their, their, their skill. Their craft is being recognised and they're all chuffed absolutely chuffed mm. they're really 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 generous great people down there mm. yeah and if i may add another one really do you also pick up used robes at the thames or in other places because no i don't do mud really i haven't done that yet yeah, yeah uh, because there are a lot of robes out in the sea of course there would be wouldn't there and they tell a story as well no? yeah of course They're like with green plants or fish bones in it or okay let's go know, really like. <laughs> so that's uh, fascinating as well thank you well thank a, you very that's much that's me an idea thank you <laughs> I was just going to say, when I first saw them, I thought they were very like tree-like. And it's interesting that I sort of see kind of trunks and like fruitfulness, which is interesting because of like the negative connotations of rope. Mm. But I looked at it and I was like, gosh, this is like kind of like a weeping willow like somehow. Like something's growing. Yeah. And anyway, I thought you might find that interesting. I do. Thank but you yeah. so much. <laughs> That's just what I was thinking. But yeah. <laughs> I think that nice... Yeah. I just wanted to say that nicely adds to kind of fertility in female figure at least is something we ca touched okay. on the catalogue just in terms of nature yeah lots of references <laughs> read the catalogue it's incredible that Larry wrote it hey um this is just a quick one but um I noticed when you're thinking and talking about your bigger sculptures you're very clear on the space they will occupy in the world um, yes. and I was just thinking given that all these guys are moving if you set them free, where do you think they would go? <laughs> Probably to the fun fair. <laughs> the freak show at the fun fair. Yes, yeah, yeah absolutely. Maybe. Yeah. You mentioned that you worked in uh, stage design, set yes. design, and I just wondered if you made costumes. No, I never. I can't work with material, I'm rubbish. But this, this is material. They look like they would be so amazing. Flat fabric confuses me. But do they have a, to be flat? I mean, it has those a look like. And it, 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 it won't they look like they're. Okay. Could you, tell, you, could tell you be me in them? How that flat piece of fabric became a sleeve. That is, to me, that is a work of art. That's genius. <laughs> <laughs> how do, I mean, I can't make fabric. I can't sew. But I just look at these and I just see people inside them. I just see them all moving because there's somebody so inside. Like, to you, it's like costume. Absolutely, ah. and would be, and such an exciting thing to be inside, all the way up to the head, all the way down to the feet. Amazing. That's a great thing to say. Thank you. I love that, especially as Kumbo um, comes from an African dance throughout Senegal and around surrounding countries, where completely head to toe, it's this fringing the dance begins on a stick and moving around. So it is a part costume, part dance. 
So yeah, spot on. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to say one thing about. I think these your work really speaks to me because I'm mixed race. I'm a woman, and I've grown up in the UK, and I f it feels very like I can understand what you're saying a lot. Although there's lots of it Good. to say, but. Uh, one thing I've noticed, and my colleague Alana and I had a very interesting conversation about hair, because of, to me, this whole thing about your knots and sailing. You know, if you can't tie knots properly, you're a little bit, you know, what's... Yeah, you're useless. Yeah, kind yeah. of, and you're really, like, you can get uh, gobbled up into the sea quite easily. Um, and I think there's this idea about guardianship and navigation, and I think that ties really beautifully into cane rows and this idea of, yeah, and like maps. Um, and I, I don't know if you know about the history of cane rows. Often it's about escaping and like roots out of the slave plantation. But I think how lovely to connect those two well, things. I, 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 I'm going to, you keep the recording of this, don't you? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I will be writing. <laughs> That's a really nice connection. That was very interesting, Lily. Um, great. Um, I think we had a very inspiring and very rich discussion, conversation. Lisa, thank you so much. And everybody else there. Yeah.